I wonder where the tradition came from of asking young children what they want to be when they grow up. I mean, it's a little strange to think that an eight-year-old would have any realistic understanding of what he or she wants to do when they grow up. Most of us got it wrong when we were eight. We got it wrong when we were 18. We probably got it wrong when we were 28. And by the time we're 38, we, a feeling of desperation begins to, to come of like, my life is not what I wanted it to be. We all struggle at some point with what we want to do with our lives and other major decisions we have to make. Where should I go to school? What should my major be? What job should I take? Whom should I marry? Should we have another child? Where should we live? Would this be a good place to raise a family? Where shall I serve God? While I was in college, Cliff attended my Young Life Club at Beaverton High School. Friends invited him and said, you got to come. So he came. But he sat in the back. He didn't want to meet me. Can't imagine why. I think it had something to do with his relationship with his dad. It wasn't very good, so he had a distrust of all men. So he'd come, but he'd stay in the back. Always in the back. First time I met him was when he signed up to come on a biking camping trip. During the summers, I was the youth pastor of, for the youth program at Valley Presbyterian Church. We only took 15 guys on, on those trips, and uh, our, our, um, our larger trips, you know, we'd have over 100 kids, but uh, on backpack trips and biking camping trips, I always limited it to 15. So during the, during the ride, I, I rode with him for a while, and between gasps, uh, he began to share his story. Things hadn't been too good. He said, he said uh, his friends talked in glowing terms about me, but he was terrified to meet me. Had a little bit to do with his dad, had a not very good relationship. What he had was abusive. He got into the whole drinking scene and drug scene. And he'd never been taught anything about God or Jesus Christ. So this whole deal of hearing about Christ, it made him feel very kind of embarrassed, awkward. Over time, he got less afraid of me, and he actually began to stop by my place. And one time, I asked him, I said, Cliff, are you ready to commit your life to Christ? He said, yes. And with tears streaming down his cheeks, he asked Jesus to forgive him for his sins and to come into his life. When he drove off that day, I said, God, it doesn't get any better than this. To take a kid who for 18 years knew nothing about you and to help him to commit his life to Christ, I can't imagine anything more exciting. On that day, I decided I would become a pastor. I would attend seminary and I would build a church or churches that would lead people of all ages to come to know Jesus Christ. I decided that day, that's what fires me up, connecting people to Jesus. What fires you up? What is it that gets you excited to get up in the morning and go to school or work? How did you end up in the field you're working in? Whether you're in retail, day trading, writing, marketing, you're a producer, a lawyer, a doctor, a computer engineer, a truck driver, police officer, administrative assistant, a grocery clerk, a professional athlete, a teacher, a salesperson, or a small business owner, I bet there was a cataclytic event in your life that caused you to decide, this is what fires me up. This is what I want to do. My guess is that initial event 
has become a powerful force force that sustains you when you face pressure or troubles in your line of work. All of us need a reason to do what we do. So it's wise for us to review from time to time why we're doing what we're doing. We also need to review how what we're doing lines up with God's grand design. We need to understand God's grand design. The frequent approach for Christians is to believe that for every decision you have to make, God has one right choice for you to make. And if you mess it up by marrying the wrong person, or taking the wrong job, you're going to have to settle for second best in your life, the rest of your life. We quote verses like, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Another one, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, We have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Here's another one. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We think God will lead us into His individualized plans that He has for our lives when we do these things. The problem is, these verses don't refer, refer to God's individual plans for our lives, but they, they're talking about His general moral will for us. God has a grand design. And if we stay within the parameters of that God, God's grand design, we have freedom to make one of many choices. Turn to our text today in your Bibles, Romans 8, 28 to 39. If you'd like to use the Bibles we have under the seats, it's on page 1,133. Paul says, And we know that in all things, this is a very famous verse, God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. These verses tell us that God has a purpose. God has a plan. God decided beforehand that his will for us is to know Christ be conformed to Christ, and to share Christ. The key to seeking God's guidance is to know His grand design. Parents, as your kids know God's grand design, they will make decisions about the stewardship of their time, talents, money, and relationships. Suppose I'm trying to decide whether to be a lawyer, doctor, teacher, or minister. According to the design, I don't need to ask God to show me whether or not I should be a teacher. I ask Him to help me know Christ and be conformed to Christ so that I can be part of His grand design to bless the world. He leaves the decision as to my occupation up to me. This explains why the Bible has very little to say about God's specific directions for your life. God shows you his grand design and he says, now you decide whether to be a carpenter, musician, or a computer programmer. You say, I'm waiting for God to show me what to do. My daughter-in-law after the first service says, you know, I used to do that. I used to pray, God, have a white car go by if I'm supposed to move back to Arizona. Have a blue car go by if I'm supposed to stay here in Portland. God says, I've already told you what I want you to do. Know Christ, be conformed to Christ, and share Christ. Now you decide whether you're going to be a pastor, professional athlete, or a plumber. That's your decision. 
God wants you to discover His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants you to be changed by His love. And then He wants you to go love the world. God cares deeply about what you do, but He doesn't take away your freedom. It's ironic that Christians through the years have asked God for specific guidance in a way that would overrule their freedom. And God has no intention of doing that. They ask for signs. And if God gave those, they would overrule our decision making. God desires not so much to run our lives, but as to have, to have us understand his grand design to know Christ, be conformed to Christ, and share Christ. It's silly to ask God for uh, guidance in areas where he's given us freedom. Suppose there's a mountain that has five routes that lead to the top. They all are perfectly good. It's foolish to ask God to guide us in the one right way when any of the five will work. What job should I take? That's your decision, God says. Where should I live? That's your decision. Where should I serve God? That's your decision. So let's look at God's grand design. First, know Christ. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. For those he foreknew. Foreknew means to know something ahead of time. Some have concluded that since God foresees who will believe, this foreknowledge is the basis of his predestination. But that can't be. If God predestines people according to what he knows ahead of time of who will believe, then that's based on their merit, something they did. But the whole point of the book of Romans we've been looking at is that salvation depends on God. We can't save ourselves. When God chose the people of Israel to be his covenant people, we read that he knew them. If you study what that word means, it essentially means he loved them. So, for new means the same as for love. He also predestined. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Predestined is the Greek word pro aritzo, which means to decide beforehand. A decision is involved in the process of becoming a Christian. But it's God's decision before it can be ours. Human beings are blind, deaf, and dead. So our conversion is impossible unless God gives us sight hearing, and life. All Christians believe in the sovereignty of God's, uh, in, in, the, in the process of salvation, and I'll prove it to you. We all thank God for our salvation. We know instinctively that we cannot save ourselves, so we thank God for saving us. And we all pray for the conversion of our relatives and friends. We say, God, bring things into their lives so they see their need for your son. We understand that salvation depends on God. That God has predestined people to know Christ, to be called and justified, has led some people to suggest that God deliberately passes over some people, predestining them to damnation. But we want to make sure we never have Scripture say something it doesn't say. Paul's not talking about non believers here, he's talking about believers. Those who are called according to his purpose. God's de grand design is for us to know Christ and experience his love for us. So Paul states some truths about God's love for us in one of the best known texts in all the Bible. Why don't you read it with me? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So let's take this apart phrase by phrase. And we know that in all things, God works through all things in our lives, even the negative things. 
He works through the suffering. He works through the evil. Some question why God allows suffering. Well, if God got rid of all evil, he'd have to get rid of me and you. He can use suffering to bring about good things. Think of something terrible that happened in your life. Maybe you got in a car accident. Or maybe you car broke down on the side of the road. Or you got lost in the woods. Or you got really sick and you were puking your guts out. Then you get together with your family or friends, maybe Thanksgiving, like this week, and you're telling the story, and everybody's laughing. They're rolling up, rolling or You know, it's just so funny. You see, God brought good out of that, right? God works. Paul says he's active. God works in your life for the good. Maybe you got something bad that's going on in your life right now and you say, why God? Paul says God works to bring good out of bad, to bring purpose out of pain. He works to bring results in your life that are good. Of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is a lamentation. Uh, Paul is not expressing some general superficial optimism that everything works out for everybody's good in this life. No, if God's grand design is that we know Christ, then the beneficiaries are those who know him. It is for those who are called according to his purpose. God has a saving purpose. God's grand design is first that we know Christ, second that we be conformed to Christ. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God's grand design is not so much that you be an architect or a doctor or a banker, but that you be conformed to Christ. And you can be conformed to Christ in any one of those occupations. He wants us to know Christ so intimately that ultimately we begin to take on the characteristics of Christ. We become like him. When the Star Spangled Banner is sung at sporting events, the climactic phrase is, the land of the free. And they hold it, and you're wondering, are they going to crack? <laughs> it states kind of our culture's primary value, freedom. We are taught in our secular culture that we have freedom to do whatever we want and no one else can tell us what to do. The only sin is to be intolerant. In years past, we were taught that we were free because we were created in God's image. Now we're taught that we're free because there is no God and there are no moral absolutes that we bow a knee to. We may live as we see fit. Freedom has come to be defined as the absence of any limitations or constraints on us. But defining freedom as the absence of any constraints is unworkable. Let me show you how freedom actually works. Suppose a guy's in his 60s and he loves to eat his certain foods. He also loves to spend time with his grandchildren. Then he goes to the doctor for his annual physical and the doctor says, unless you stop eating these fatty foods, these sweet foods, you're going to have a heart attack. Now, our culture describes freedom as the freedom to do whatever you want with no constraints. But in reality, this guy is faced with a choice. You can either have freedom to eat whatever you want or you can have freedom to see your grandchildren. You can't do both. So it turns out our culture's definition of freedom doesn't work. Turns out what freedom is, is the choice of what constraints to put on your life. Which freedoms are more important to you? Is it to eat whatever you want? 
Or is it to experience the loving relationships that give your life meaning? But you can't have both. Let me give you another example. Suppose you get in a love relationship with somebody here in this town. That relationship begins to put constraints on you that you didn't have before. Before, you could get up and go away for the weekend. You don't have to tell anybody. You're free. But if you do that now, you'll get a phone call. Where are you? I can't believe you left town without telling me. You say, you can't tell me what to do. I'm free. Nobody tells me what decision to make. And there's a pause at the other end. And then you hear a, I think we should break up. <laughs> and she's perfectly right. If you're in a strong, loving relationship, you don't have freedom anymore to do whatever you want to do. You can be in a strong, loving relationship or you can be totally free and autonomous, but you can't have both. Paul says, we find our greatest freedom when we give up our freedom to sin and become slaves to Christ in order to be conformed to His image. We restrict our freedom to do whatever we want to become a slave to Christ. God's grand design is that we know Christ, be conformed to Christ, and third, to share Christ. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Christ was raised from the dead to become the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. When we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we become part of his family and we're called on to go share with other people so that Christ will have many, many brothers and sisters. Paul's teaching is similar to what we find in Genesis 12 where we read about God calling Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Then he gives a promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. His promise came true. God has blessed the world through the Hebrew people. As Christians have been grafted into God's people, we inherit the promise to Abraham to be a blessing to the world. God tells Abraham that he's going to bless him. And he asks Abraham to become a blessing to others. That's always the way it is. God blesses us, then we bless others. We receive from God, then we give to others. Apostle John got this. He says, we love... Because he first loved us. We experience God's love, then we share God's love. Paul calls us to experience God's love as he asks some rhetorical questions, beginning with verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God says he's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Paul says, if God gave his son to die for us, how will he not give us everything else that we need? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. If God says you're forgiven by giving your life to Christ, who can bring a charge against you? 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who brings a charge against us? Who condemns us? Not Christ. He's at the right hand of God the Father praying for us. 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves us. In response, he tells us to go out and love other people, build relationships with other people so we can share Christ with them. People that have moved from atheism to Christ tell me that a key to that process was establishing a friendship with a Christian. The whole process gained traction when they began to trust a Christian. In years past, Christians in the church enjoyed general respect of the culture. Not anymore. Whenever somebody asks me, what, what do you do? I say, oh, here we go. <laughs> say, I'm a pastor. And often I'll see a visceral reaction. <coughs> really? <laughs> you kidding me? Because they begin to review in their mind, what did I just say to him? What have I done in his presence? He's going to judge me for. <laughs> the reason people have a negative impression when you tell them you're a Christian is because thoughts begin to flash through their minds. Oh, here we go. I'm going to get judged. I'm going to be condemned. Christians are the most judgmental people in the world. They're the most narrow-minded. If you want to get beyond that distrust with people that aren't Christians and share Christ... You have to be a friend. When it comes to seeking God's guidance, understand God's grand design. Know Christ, be conformed to Christ, and share Christ. See that you're fulfilling God's grand design and then enjoy your freedom to make choices within that. I cannot help but think that this whole issue of divine guidance is overrated. Hundreds of books have been sold. There are conferences on this subject. God simply wants us to know Christ, be conformed to Christ, and share Christ. Within his grand design, he wants you to reflect on what is it that fires you up to get up in the morning? My experience with Cliff showed me that I get fired up by connecting people to Jesus. What is it that fires you up? What are you passionate about? God wants you to discover what your passion is and then use it to be a blessing to people. Understand God's grand design. To know Christ. Say this with me. You've heard me say it so many times this morning. Be conformed to Christ and share Christ. Within that, you decide what fires you up and go for it. Would you pray? Father, thank you for inspiring the Apostle Paul. This isn't, these aren't just words from a man, a smart man. These are your divine words Inspired, telling us what your grand design, what your big will is for us. To know you, know your son, be conformed to him, and to share him. I want to give you a chance to respond to God. Heads bowed. <clears throat> I want you to pray. God wants you to know Christ. <clears throat> if you're not sure you've ever given your life to Christ, you could do it right now. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died for me. Would you forgive my sins? And would you come into my life? You do that right now. Or you can tell God, you know, I think I've already done that, but I want your will for my life and I want to know you, be conformed to you, and to share you. Help me to do that. And then within that, to just lighten up about this whole thing of which decisions should I make about this or that. You give me freedom. You pray right now.
Thank you, Father, that you have a plan for this world, for everybody in this world. You created it. You created us. You love us. You want us to know you. Become like your son and share him. Help us to do that and make choices with freedom this week within that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.